Okay, welcome everybody to this week's lecture in cognitive psychology and today we'll start speaking about language uh, and next week we'll continue that on language and I would like to start this very first part of the first lecture of language with a brief introduction into linguistics mainly to define the terms and concepts you will use throughout this lecture. Okay, so let's start with some definitions. What is language? And a definition for language is that it is the human capacity for acquiring and using complex systems of communication. So in this language, uh, sorry, in this definition, language is really specific to humans. And although animals can actually learn quite a lot of communication or communicative abilities as well, it, from a scientific linguistic perspective, it wouldn't be considered to be language. And um, it also says that language is really our ability to communicate in by means of complex systems and also our ability to acquire and use them. And for that, we usually use arbitrary symbols, which we, in everyday terms, would use, uh, would say, uh, the words. So, for instance, in English, we say a tree, and in German, we say Baum. And the name tree and Baum are pretty arbitrary to describe this plant, this big plant with a trunk and leaves and, and things like that. And language is also characterized by a hierarchical structure. And we will see that in, in this part as well in more detail. So we have small units of sounds which can be combined to words, which then can be combined into sentences. And by combining the different sounds in different ways and by arranging different words in different ways, we can basically create an infinite number of utterances and and produce such a variety of language and communication. Okay, so what is linguistics then in this context? And linguistics means it's the scientific study of language. And uh, linguistics has many sub-areas and one of the sub-areas are is called psycholinguistics. And you may already guess what it is about. It's about the psychological aspects of linguistics. So um, it's what psychological and also neurobiological factors which are there to enable humans to acquire language, to use language, to comprehend and produce language. And typical questions are, how can we generate meaningful sentences? And how do children acquire language? And these are just some, some aspects of that. So when we create uh, a scheme or um, a tree of linguistics as the whole scientific study of language, we, in the next, we will look mainly at theoretical linguistics. I will explain that in a moment what it means. But there are also many, many other areas like descriptive linguistics, applied linguistics, experimental linguistics. However, this area of theoretical linguistics um, has different sub-areas again, which can be sorted kind of on, on a trajectory of complexity. And we'll start with phonology, which is about the sounds. This can be further subdivided to phonemics and phonetics. Then these different sounds can be combined to form words. So the study of words is called morphology. The words can be combined into sentences and the structure of sentences is called syntax. Then we have semantics, which is about the meaning because after all, the purpose of language is to convey meaning. To communicate. And finally we will speak about pragmatics. This is how the context affects and influences the meaning. And because this is not the core of what we speak about today, some of these things we will brush over rather quickly because we don't need the level of detail in which you could go to. 
Okay, let's start with the area of phonology, the sounds of that. So phonology is the study of sounds as abstract elements in the speaker's mind that distinguish meaning. That may sound very complicated, but luckily it's not too too bad. So let's look at phonemics and you will see in a moment that you most likely already had quite a bit of contact with phonemics and phonemes and a phoneme is the basic unit of a language phonology which is combined with other phonemes to form meaningful units such as words. So when we break that down in the area of sounds, what's the smallest, units, smallest unit? In written language this would be the equivalent of a letter However, as we will see, phonemes and letters don't always have a one-to-one -one, um, relationship to each other. To give you an example um, of such, such a phoneme, which is the smallest unit, which may bring about a challenge, change of meaning, is in English, we for instance have the phoneme R and the phoneme L. And they have different meanings, so that royal and loyal are two different words, which mean two different things. In other languages, R and L may not be two different phonemes. And therefore, if we exchange the R for an L, or the other way around, we don't necessarily bring about a change of meaning. And that's why people from some language backgrounds have difficulties distinguishing R and L, because in their language these two phonemes do not bring about a change in meaning. So it's these most basic units which we then combine into words. And for a phoneme to be defined as a phoneme, it must be the case that when we change it, we change the meaning of the word. And I said you probably came across that in the form of phonemic stock charts. In particular, if you learn foreign languages, then you will see these charts. And the reason to do this is, as I mentioned before, the letters do not always uh, are not always a good reflect, uh, representation of the phonemes, because we can have different ways how um, or diff the same letters may be used for different phonemes, depending on the context, and things like that. And, and here we see these new symbols which then describe the phoneme. It's surprising that although we have so many different languages around the world, um, we use pretty much similar phonemes. So if we would create a phonemic chart across all languages, it wouldn't actually be that huge. Of course it's bigger than the chart of a single language, but there are a lot there is a lot of overlap across languages with respect to the phon phonemic charts. Okay, and yeah, just as another example, for instance, the TH phoneme, like the think, that's something, um, which in that form, this phoneme does not exist in the German language, which is why Germans often have this accent and have this difficult with think and would pronounce it as sink or zinc or something like that, because they just don't have the phoneme. Okay, let's go on. So, to continue that, um, I already briefly mentioned that when we have one phoneme, let's say a k sound, then this phoneme may actually be linked or represented by different letters in writing. And the letters are also called graphemes, so we say we don't necessarily have a perfect phoneme to grapheme relationship or association. And these are examples, so we can have cat, kit, school, skill. You don't need to stop here. You can go into more details and look exactly at the phonemes, at, at, at the so sounds which are produced, and then you may sometimes f see that <coughs> they sound slightly different, so there are further ways to subdivide that. However, if you would cut out the sound, 
you make in school and add it to the cat, you know, with an audio editor, you would not bring about a change of meaning. It would still be, you would still identify it as cat. So it would still be classified as the same phoneme. <coughs> okay, so um, in phonemics, we investigate the meaning behind the sounds. So, because the sound brings about a change in meaning or reflects a certain meaning. And in phonetics, it's more about the sounds itself, the physical properties behind the sounds. So these people do a lot of acoustical analysis uh, with, you know, high quality microphones recording that and then looking at what elements are there in the sound. We will look at this at a later part. So it's about the physical production, the acoustic properties, the transmission of the acoustical signal from speaker or sender to listener or receiver, and the perception of the sounds. Okay, so, so much for the sounds, the phonology of things. And next I would like to just very briefly speak about the morphology. And morphology is the study of word structure. So, what patterns, how, what rules are there in a language to form different words? And again, this differs across languages. So, basically everything we talk about here is influenced by, by the language and different between languages. Of course, there are always overlaps, but don't, uh, when we have these examples, don't necessarily assume it might be the identical uh, rule in your language. So for English, as an example, we may have a sentence like the dog runs or the dogs run. And what we see here is that we have the basic word dog and the basic word run and we have the affix s, so we add something to the word stem, to the basic word, and make different grammatical forms out of that. And so, and if the noun is in singular, then the verb needs the s. And if the noun is in plural, multiple dogs run, then we have the basic form and not the s attached to that. And we can modulate words in various ways. We can uh, add the S for the plural. We can, for the past tense, the ED, for instance. Um, and like to attach and then attached the ED in the end. Or we can add a prefix to that, like undo something along those lines. So morphology just looks at how do we create words and there are rules to that and these are described. In the syntax um, domain, again very briefly just, we look at how do we combine words to form a grammatically correct sentence, a meaningful sentence. <clears throat> And as an example, in English, we have the rule that we should order the words in the sense first the subject, then the verb, and then the object. So, the boy throws a stone is the correct order, and, and we do that. Incorrect order would be the boy a stone throws. And again, the syntax, the way how we arrange words, is heavily dependent on the language and may differ between languages, which again explains why people who learn a foreign language often use the wrong word order, because they use the order of their native words. It's interesting to note that we are actually quite robust in um, accounting for mistakes in grammar. So even if the grammar is wrong, then often we can still understand the sentence and, and derive the meaning of it. Next, let's look at semantics. So the meaning of the words. How is meaning expressed in languages? And as I said before, that's one of the key things of language, to express meaning, to convey messages. 
and the meaning is affected by the words itself and the syntax as well and different words have obviously different meanings uh, there are synonyms but in, in total of the whole corpus of words of the lexicon of a language these are a small number only and often the synonyms carry slightly different connotations so you would use one word more in one context and another word in another context so in general there's very little total redundance in a language however the meaning of a word may also change depending on the syntax for instance uh, the means the structure of the sentence. An example would be Peter's hair needs cutting badly versus Peter's hair badly needs cutting. And there are further things um, even more complex which may change the meaning. For instance the intonation of the sentence, the prosody of the sentence. And the prosody and intonation may determine whether um, I say it in a normal voice indicating that I actually mean what I say or I say it in an ironic or sarcastic intonation and then it may actually invert the semantic meaning of the words of the literal meaning of the sentence and I would have to interpret that and finally you may say on hierarchically on the highest level is the area of pragmatics and this is how the context affects um, the understanding of what we do. And I would like to... Um, oh, sorry, it comes in a moment. <clears throat> so, the way in which the context contributes to the meaning. And a problem is that we are usually so good at this that we don't realize this but if we take just literal sentences out of the context we would realize that there's often actually quite a bit of ambiguity in our expressions and how do we disambiguate that to understand the sender and un the context helps us in that and this effect of the context on our interpretation of the literal meaning of a statement this is called pragmatics and we often don't even realize how much we interpret and assume beyond the literal meaning and a good example again is the Big Bang Theory um, I'll just uh, look for the video and let's have a look at that and for those of you who don't know that uh, Sheldon is a person who often takes things very literal and has problems with interpersonal communication because he finds it challenging to derive the emotions of others and, and things like that and let's see what happens here um, they both are in their apartment and there is a knock on the door and it's about who opens the door Want to get that? Not particularly. <laughs> could you get that? I suppose I could if I were asked. Would you please get that? Of course. <laughs> Why do you have to make things so complicated? Okay, listen to it once more and try to think about what the literal um, statements are actually are and how this res his responses are, Sheldon's responses are. So that if you take his statements literal you can understand that but in everyday life of course it's an inappropriate response. Want to get that? Not particularly. <laughs> Could you get that? I suppose I could if I were asked. Would you please get that? Of course. <laughs> Why do you have to make things so complicated? Want to get that? And Sheldon is right in the sense that if we are not good at pragmatics, it makes our life complicated. Let's have a quick other example along the same lines. 
um, which illustrates that. So you may ask a friend, can you open the window? And one response may be, yes, I can, and does nothing. And the second response is, your friend just opens the window. And depending on the context, both may be actually the appropriate response. So for instance, you're talking about a window which is very hard to open because it's a little bit broken. And it's more along the lines of, can you open the window? Because I can't. And then, yes, I can, I am able to. And not doing anything may be appropriate because it's about a discussion of um, who can and who can't open the window, the broken one. And if it's just very hot and stuffy and the window is perfectly fine, then um, to open the window can be the perfect response to that. So it's really the context and this is also called implicatures. So inferring on the intended meaning of a message so that I can use the context to try to understand what probably did the other person want to communicate. And that's one of the big challenges for computerized systems who want to understand more complex language to understand exactly these implicatures. Okay, so um, I've dropped the term a few times, but you may miss a very common everyday term in this context, in this graph. And that's the term of grammar. And there are slightly different definitions, but um, usually people would combine phonology, morphology and syntax into the term grammar. So when we talk about, oh, you have a problem with grammar, we usually mean um, that um, you use a wrong syntax, that you um, ch use f wrong words, forms, like the docs runs, that's not a proper sentence, and things like that. Okay, as usual, if you have any questions, feel free to bring them to the seminar or post them in the uh, BBL discussion forum. Okay, thanks a lot for listening.